Reporters for Vice News travel the world, putting a human face to the world's most important stories. There's a solid wall of riot police officers. But now we introduce you to them. They're doing CPR on one of the casualties here. We don't know if he's going to make it. This is Field Notes, a show that sits down with our reporters to find out the stories behind their stories and how they got so close to the action. Feeling pretty good about that? In this episode, we'll talk to the team that's been reporting on the real on-the-ground effects of the abortion ban in Texas, a beat that took them to Oklahoma. With the Supreme Court case coming out that could overturn Roe v. Wade, and with several other states thinking of enacting bans like Texas is, what kind of future do you think we're looking at? It's so scary, right? I see a world where women die. It's very simple, right? Making an abortion un illegal or unaccessible doesn't mean it doesn't happen. History's shown us that already. So in, a, in an atmosphere where women are being attacked, where their very basic right is being stripped away from them piece by piece, state by state, senator by senator, governor by governor, there is a world of death out there for those women. Because a woman who does not want to be pregnant and or cannot handle another child will figure out how not to be. And when there are not legal and safe, accessible ways to do that, it becomes dangerous. And we will see women die. A woman is going to die because she's been denied her basic health care. Well, Gilad Carter, thank you guys so much for being here to talk about your incredible, incredible reporting on the abortion crisis that's happening in Texas right now. When you guys first went down there, did you know what you would find? Did you know what kind of people would be available to talk to you, what you would see? No, we kind of just decided that we were going to show up at this clinic. We had arranged with that, that we would go and we would just find out which patients might be willing to chat with us. And then you got there and among the people you met was this incredible woman, Jasmine. Why do you think she agreed to share her story so much on camera? I think part of it is that Jasmine, throughout this entire time, was really clear that what was happening to her was happening to many, many people across Texas. And she felt very strongly that this was not just a personal experience, it was a political one, and that she had been silenced by the Texas state legislature, by the Texas governor, and prevented from doing something that she felt very strongly was her right to do. I mean, she took incredible risks in speaking with us and going public with her story. Uh, we later learned that her mother is not uh, someone who would support the decision she made and would actually disown her. And she had told us um, that she really was like worried that she could lose her mother and that her children, she has two other daughters, could lose their, their grandparent. And um, by going forward, she had time to like think through the repercussions. There was not a rush decision that had to be made. Hi, Jasmine. I'm Marva. I'm the director of clinical services. You're measuring at 6.1 weeks today, but we do see fetal cardiac activity on the ultrasound. So, as of September 1st in Texas, what that means is that you are ineligible to have an abortion in the state of Texas right now. Your next options would be traveling out of state to get the procedure done. I didn't even know that I was pregnant. I kind of just took a test. Wow. Just to see what, you know, what it would come out with. And I had a period. So uh, Jasmine's story was just so indicative of this crisis, this dilemma facing in all of these ways, all of these women across the state. Tell me her story and tell me what women are facing right now in Texas with this new law. So Jasmine is 26 years old. She is a mother of two and she used birth control and she used plan B the morning after pill and she had a normal period. And the only reason she took the pregnancy test that she had lying around was because she had been pregnant before and she felt kind of weird. And so when she found out that she was pregnant, she basically had like less than a week to get into a clinic and she wasn't able to do that because of the scheduling in Texas. And so she just missed that cutoff. There was cardiac activity on the ultrasound because she was six weeks and one day pregnant. It was by one day, really? Is that really what it was? It's kind of complex. Okay. So the way the Texas law is framed is it's framed as a 
six-week abortion ban, but that's not necessarily the case. What it is is it bans abortion as soon as cardiac activity can be detected on an ultrasound. And that can emerge as early as six weeks into a pregnancy. I see. But when we say cardiac activity, what we're really talking about is the embryo at that point does not really have a fully developed heartbeat. It doesn't have the thudding and the closing of valves in the way that we think of it. So basically once that cardiac activity is detected, which is what happened in Jasmine's case, that's why she couldn't get the abortion, not because of that six week cutoff. And you were finding women who showed up and were finding out, oh, I, I can't do this now, right? You, like, this was happening while you were there. Right. So we actually ended up filming with three women in the clinic, two of whom made it into the piece. One of those women found out that she was under the benchmark. She could get an abortion in Texas, and she ended up doing so. Another woman, Diana, came in, and she basically found out that it looked like she wasn't pregnant, but she still might be. It might be too early on in her pregnancy to really tell. And so uh, the providers at the clinic advised her to come back and get checked again. And she ended up getting a pregnancy test in her hometown. And she was pregnant a week later. And she had to go back again to the clinic and hope that she was again under that benchmark right. in order to get an abortion. It's not like suddenly now she has six weeks from then. I mean, no. you, maybe explain this to me like I'm dumb. Because, I, and this is me also maybe being a man and not having to think about this on a right. Like, like how, how, how careful do you have to be to actually do this the right way? Like, how, how possible is it for the average person to do this the way the law demands? So it is so easy to miss this time period. Basically, if you miss your period, you have two weeks to realize that and two weeks to get into an abortion clinic in order to get your abortion. So when we say six weeks, that sounds like you have six weeks to make this decision and to figure out the scheduling and the timing and all of that. In reality, you have at most two weeks. And these clinics are inundated. I mean, they're, they're seeing more patients now than they've been seeing before. I mean, actually, while we were there, many patients weren't showing up and weren't scheduling because by the time we had gotten there, they had already started to look elsewhere. There were a bunch of people who just didn't show up in the mm. end. But getting those schedules in those very few clinics. And Texas is a, a huge state, and people were driving you know, many miles to get there. Diana, the one woman um, who we spoke with, she came from Waco all the way to Fort Worth. So it's a bit of a, a desert in terms of getting access to abortion and then finding your place, getting a scheduled appointment within what could be at most a two-week window is just you know, very difficult. Yeah. And I should say, the other thing that complicates this two-week window is Texas has an additional law that requires someone to go into a clinic, get counseling in about abortion, and then come back 24 hours later for that abortion. So you really need to also build in that 24-hour period of time whereby you can go in, get that counseling, be under the mark, no problem, come back in the next day, and this cardiac activity, and you can't get that abortion anymore. Wow. So you have all these pre-existing obstacles that are now being piled on top of this very, very strict law. Right. In the second part of your, your piece, you guys follow Jasmine to Oklahoma. What, what's, the, what's the burden to do that? I mean, because some could say, oh, she just drove to Oklahoma, you know? So she got it done. It, it was taken care of. What, what, what obstacles does that create for her? Well, so Jasmine actually lives in North Texas, which is a little bit easier to get to Oklahoma. So she had the easier route among people in Texas. That was still a 200 mile drive. It was three to four hours. It was in the middle of the night because she is a working woman. She's a mom. She has to squeeze this procedure into a very narrow window of time. And the other thing is Jasmine had actually not left the state in years. Jasmine had been to Mexico once as a child, and that was the only time she had ever really left Texas. And so emotionally, this also felt really meaningful and really big to her. Well, and you made, you made the choice like, not to have Carter, not to sit in the car with her while she drove all the way, right? To let that car ride happen the way it would without your intervention, but to do the trip sort of along with her in a separate car. And I think, I don't know that Jasmine would have wanted us to be in the car the entire time because she was working through so much. And I think she, as she was having conversations with her boyfriend, Alex, she expressed a lot of things that she might not have felt comfortable expressing to us at that time. She knew she was being recorded. She was comfortable with that. But I think she had more space to speak to her intimate partner and process these emotions. I wish I knew where the I was going. Texas wants to be a bitch. Like, why am I having to go to Oklahoma? That shit is stupid as fuck. I had my period. Like, that's what's... And, like, Alex, imagine if I didn't take that test. Imagine. I would have never fucking known. 
And that's what pisses me off. Like, bro, I should be able to make that decision. Not y'all. Y'all aren't the ones carrying the, the fucking thing. Y'all aren't the ones that are having to deal with my life and deal with what I got going on. I did what I needed to do. As someone who has reported on abortion rights for a really long time, I can say that a lot of reporters want to do what Jasmine allowed us to do and travel with someone as they go out of state for an abortion. And I've never been able to find someone who's been willing to do that. But I do think that for a lot of people, the Texas abortion ban is a huge moment and they're really fed up and frustrated and they're finally willing to let the media in to share what that frustration looks like. Yeah. And then you, you talk about this in the piece, but can you talk about some of the costs that are associated? Because there's, there's financial burden that she had to take on too, right? Jasmine ended up taking out a loan to help cover the costs, but she had to pay for getting her car serviced. She needed an oil change. She had to get fuel. Um, she needed to get a hotel night to stay overnight in Oklahoma. And she had to pay for childcare as well. The loan was $1,350, and she thinks by the time she's going to be able to pay it back, it will be a $1,500 expense. Taking about six months to a year, possibly, to get out of that financial hole. Wow. Is Roe v. Wade over? Is that kind of the lesson of what you found in Texas? That was kind of our working thesis. That was the thing we were trying to sort out. And I think from talking to Jasmine, from talking to providers, I think effectively, yes, it is over. I mean, this is still a court battle, so this case is gonna go up to the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court could decide to strike down this Texas ban. But right now, if you're a person trying to get an abortion in Texas, you do not have the protections of Roe v. Wade. I believe 85% of people who get abortions in Texas are after that six week period. So for 85% of people, abortion is not accessible in their own home state. So if Roe is supposed to ensure that they have access to abortion, for 85% of Texans, that's just not an option anymore. So yeah, through our reporting, we kind of discovered that Roe is still intact, but it's been gutted to this point where it doesn't really virtually impact your life or, or protect your personal access given these very stringent circumstances. So, so on paper it exists, but in practice the protections have been chipped away so much that they, they barely exist. Yes. I also want to note that this is not something that just happened out of the blue. Texas in particular has been hacking away at Roe v. Wade for many, many years. Many red states across the country have been hacking away at Roe. And so a lot of people in the South will say that even prior to SB 8, Roe was just not a reality for people. In one of the pieces you spent some time with this youth group of pro-lifers, kids who are going around sharing talking points and encouraging people to, to sue someone, which is an element of this law that we haven't really talked about, but to actually sue people. It does feel like there's been this organized, orchestrated push by the people trying to chip away at Roe for a very, very long time. Is there the same thing on the other side or is it time for people to pay more attention on the other side? What needs to happen? I think that the pro-abortion right side has struggled very much in trying to counter the anti-abortion side of things. The anti-abortion movement is extraordinarily well organized. If you go to, say, the March for Life and you talk to people there, which I have done, they will repeat the same talking points verbatim all the time. They will say that they want to make abortion not only illegal, they want to make it unthinkable. And that is incredible messaging that they're able to take thousands of people across the country and get them to all say the same thing and all believe the same thing. And I just don't think you see that among abortion rights supporters. I think abortion rights supporters have really not been able to get a cohesive message out there. They haven't been able to proactively fight for abortion rights. They're always on defense in court and they're continuing to be on defense. And I think really what we're going to be seeing in the next couple of weeks is the final victory of the uh, anti-abortion side. I think that they have gotten to the point where they can dismantle Roe, which is the thing they've wanted for 50 years, and it's not great right now if you are supporting abortion rights. Yeah, and they're, they're incredibly effective in their, in their language, in their like salesmanship of this law. I mean, we followed one group of these students for life who door knocked on, on a neighbor, and we watched them and listened how they were able to change his opinion on the law. He started as being someone who says, I don't really know too much about it, but I'm curious. And I, I do believe that women should have the choice up to a certain point, but I'm not really sure. And over the course of this conversation, these students were able to change his mind to say, well, actually, I guess I believe now that 
life begins at conception, in which case I guess I, I, I don't know if abortion should be available at any point. Mm. And just watching and listening and just staying back and letting that sound just kind of play out on its own uh, gave us this window into like, you know, the, this campaign that's been pushing these laws. But it, it feels on some level like, you know, there's been, okay, the letter of the law has been Roe, which was pretty strong, but all of the cultural momentum to some extent outside of maybe major cities like New York and DC and LA, this powerful cultural momentum has been working the other way. And even you see with Jasmine, the fact that, you know, her own mother is opposed to it. She has to kind of sneak around. There's a sense that people who are getting abortions are doing it secretly and quietly, even, even now. Yeah, part of the unprecedented twist in SBA is that everyday citizens can sue anyone who they suspect is aiding or abetting an abortion uh, that takes place after six weeks. So um, it sets up neighbors against neighbors where it's not only that your doctor who's providing an abortion could be sued, but someone who perhaps helped drive you to the clinic can be sued, or your Uber driver, or a family member who helped pay for you to get an abortion. So yeah, there's certainly creating this, this uh, feeling of like, yeah, you have to, you kind of have to hide and, and be very careful who you tell and who knows. Um, and part of the, the reason why we spent time with the Students for Life, that group we spent um, going door to door, door knocking, is that they were canvassing a neighborhood to provide them with more information so they can be aware of how they can get involved in the law where you can actively sue and then get a bounty of $10,000 in damages should you succeed in, in, um, in suing. Do they feel like they're winning? Is that your impression? Yes. They definitely feel like they're winning. They feel like they're moving past even trying to litigate around Roe, legislate around Roe and abortion. What they want to do is change cultural norms around getting pregnant and having a baby. So they were talking to people about you know, adoption and other options like that. Students for Life in particular has really gauged itself around being a post-Roe organization. And they feel like their moment is nigh. One of the things that, that struck me watching this was the providers you talked to. You talked to them kind of in between these moments with the women who were there. What was their experience of all of this like? Again, I think because this law is written in a way that even if you just suspect that someone is violating the law, that is means enough to start a lawsuit. Whether you win or not, that's a different story. But that will suck just so many resources and time. So any of these providers, uh, this one in particular we spend a lot of time with, Marva Sadler, um, you know, she could potentially be sued because of this work. And she had this emotional moment in, in our story where she kind of reflected on the day. Like the day we were there, she had turned away 10 different patients. It, it almost seemed like she had been working so much. There was just like so much to do that that was like the only time of the day where she actually had a moment to sit down and having that opportunity to just reflect. It, it almost seemed like she was kind of figuring that out for herself um, in real time. I saw a young mother today with a baby on her hip. I'll take that risk for her. This particular clinic that we were at had actually been at the center of a Supreme Court battle a couple years previously, which they had won. They had won uh, back some protections for abortions. And they felt throughout that that they always had a way to help people. They always had a way to help their patients. And now they felt like they really didn't have anything. They could not do anything for them. And all they could do was say, good luck somewhere else or have this baby. Another thing we learned um, through this reporting, and Carter, you probably knew this before, but it was new to me that almost every single provider we spoke to was actually flying in out of state. You know, one of those reasons is that it's just so difficult. Um, there's so much violence and intimidation against their work. It's very difficult to live in the same state where you're providing abortions. So. Um, some of these clinics are, are relying on, on doctors and providers to be coming in from out of state, uh, taking days off from their other work to be able to do this work here. The provider we met at the Oklahoma clinic, she has a full-time job, and she was using her vacation days to come in and do abortions wow. on Fridays and Saturdays wow. once a month. Was that because of the, the influx from Texas, or was that something she always does? She's always done that. She used to work in Oklahoma, and she has since left Oklahoma, and she just feels that it's so important to provide this type of care for folks that she is willing to do that. Stopping women from getting abortion legally in Texas isn't going to stop women from trying to get abortions, right? that woman who's desperate is gonna, is gonna maybe find another way if she can. Marva said that she believes that women will die as a result of this law, that, that this law, these laws are not gonna stop a woman who's determined to get an abortion and they may seek alternative opportunities 
um, that may jeopardize their health and, and potentially take their lives. I should say that there are safe ways for people to self-manage an abortion, as it's called, up until a certain point of pregnancy. You can take abortion-inducing pills, and the World Health Organization has a protocol for people to do that at home. But there are going to be a wide swath of people who miss that cutoff and who are still pregnant past 10 weeks, past 12 weeks, and don't want to be. And we don't know what's going to happen to them. We do know that abortion has always existed. You covered this for a really long time. I mean, are, are we at a crisis point right now? Is this, is this an inflection point in abortion in America? This is for sure an inflection point for abortion in America. I think what's really happened over the last 10 years is there have been restriction after restriction after restriction. And those restrictions used to be chipping away at Roe v. Wade. They used to be doing smaller things that were geared at closing clinics. And then in the last two years, we've seen an explosion in uh, legislation just bans abortion entirely. That bans it almost totally in Alabama. That bans it as early as six weeks in Texas and several other states. And what we've seen is that those sorts of bans move their way through the courts and they get ex to exactly the point that the anti-abortion right wants them to be at. They get to the point where the Supreme Court, which is now dominated by conservatives, can overturn Roe v. Wade. This Supreme Court case that's coming up on December 1st is probably going to be the most pivotal abortion case in a generation. And I talk to a lot of pro-abortion rights activists. I talk to a lot of people who oppose abortion rights and very few of them think that Roe v. Wade is going to survive this. The Supreme Court could overturn it on paper, could really say Roe v. Wade is over, or they could just gut it to the point that it doesn't matter anymore. And I think come next June, we're going to be living in a really different America for abortion rights. And what, what does that America look like? I mean, what, what happens then? Do you, have, do you have states where it's safe to have an abortion and safe for states where it's not? I mean, is it, is it that simple? What we were trying to provide is, you asked, what does the end of Roe v. Wade look like? And Jasmine provided a window into what that looks like, where people have to go out of state to get abortions. And I think one of our challenges was, like, how do we tell that story visually? And how do we kind of get out of the way so she could tell the story in her own words and without us interrupting to, to say, well, how do you feel now? And, and like, well, what are you thinking now? And kind of just let her, let her be the author of her own story um, while still coming in to provide context and like um, perspective as well. Basically, once Roe v. Wade falls, if it falls, then the states will once again have the ability to regulate abortion as much as they want. And it seems this country will split half and half, where some states will protect it and some states won't. And so you're going to see many people like Jasmine who are going from the South, going from the Midwest, up into the West Coast, up until the East Coast, to try to get abortions. And the people who end up making it are going to be the people who actually have the means to do that. You know, like, this was a huge expense for Jasmine. And a lot of people can't even afford to spend that much. Well, Carter, Gilad, thank you guys so much for yeah, thank you coming for and us. talking about this piece and for your, your continued coverage of this. It's very important. Thank you.